Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland around your head and pendants for your neck. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy truth and do not sell it. Buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. The father of a righteous man has great joy. He who has a wise son delights in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. He who fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for his children it will be a refuge. For the past several months, I've been preaching completely to Mark McHenry, our camera guy. And I haven't seen any change in his life at all. Uh, but with, with more of you here today, I'm a little more optimistic along the way. Uh, Mark, I truly am grateful for your faithfulness and, and how you're, you edit the video to make me look better each and every week. So thank you for that. The, um, We've been taking a journey through the book of Proverbs. Uh, my bride and I uh, each day have been reading through a chapter of Proverbs corresponding to the day. So that means today is June 14th. So today we will at dinner time read the 14th chapter of Proverbs. I love this book. This book has remarkable wisdom not only for changing the way that I think, but also to understand the good life, the life that is full and rich and meaningful. I love the book of Proverbs. Today we're going to talk about words. And what do words mean in light of the powerful word of God? Words and integrity and how those words, coupled with our actions, serve as a testimony to what we really think and what we really believe. But before we get started today, I would like to make an apology for something that I said in the sermon last week. I was careless. I didn't do it intentionally, but I was still careless when I talked about the protests that were going on around the country, I used a wrong word. I used the word riot. What I was referring to were people who were taking advantage of a situation to rob and to loot and to steal, to undermine the efforts of all the peaceful protests that were going on. Again, it wasn't intentional, but still, I said the wrong word. And because I said that publicly, I need to own that publicly. So the right word is protest. The church body of which we belong, the Lutheran heritage, actually refers to protestants. We get the word Protestant from that. When we stand up and we say something is not right about that because it devalues people or it devalues the name of God and we're going to speak out against it. In the past few months, it has been uh, only shown more clearly how followers of Jesus need to be protestants, that we have high value and dignity for life. How do we do that? It begins with the words that we use and how our actions go along with our words. I have uh, two numbers for you, 18,000 to 25,000. Hmm? That's the number of words that the average person speaks 
in a single day. 18,000 to 25,000 words. Some of you may go, I've been trying to get a word out of my spouse on anything for a while. That's a different scenario. But our normal use of words, the volume of words that we use is between 18 to 25,000, which means that every day we write basically a 54-page book a record, if you will, a chronicle of what comes out of our mouth. Now, most of us have a vocabulary of about 5,000 words, which is a second or third grade level, and there may be a few more words in the English language along the way. Words. Words are powerful. Words have meaning. In addition to that number of 18 to 25,000, I have another statistic for you here. 80% and 20%. 80 and 20. 80% refers to the, uh, number, the percentage of people who think as they talk. In other words, you're not exactly sure where you're going to go with your sentence until you get to the end of your sentence. I know this is me because I'm thinking about it as I'm speaking. Eight out of ten of us think as we talk. The other 20%, and that's being generous, by the way, the other 20% are people who think before they talk. Blessed are the people who think before they talk. Oh, how blessed the 20% are. Instead of what we just said hanging out there in the air, those folks have the opportunity to think about it and then add to the conversation. Words, the way we express words, the creativity that God has given to us between men and women and people and so forth, the various ways that we communicate. Another way that we talk about it is in these two terms here, painters and pointers. There's generally two categories of conversation, painters and pointers. Painters are people who, when they talk, they paint a picture. They use hyperbole. They use exaggeration. They use broad and beautiful and amazing colors. And they just, when they're talking, they just want to paint you a picture. And so they're all over the canvas with bright and bold and amazing colors when they talk. Painters love to paint a picture. It's not the first thing that comes out of their mouth that they want to talk about. It's the last thing as they present the painting for you to see. Pointers, on the other hand, go right to the what? Right to the point. The first thing that comes out of their mouth, that's what they mean. Painters want to solve issues now. Pointers want to push away, think about it, and then come back two to three centuries later and, and really bring about some resolution. Painters are passionate about what they're feeling. Pointers want to get it right. So they need to step away, and then they want to address it well. Painters are attracted to pointers, and pointers are attracted to to painters. It's not that one is better or worse than the other. It's just the way that we're wired along the way. 54-page book every day, people who think before they talk, or people who think as they talk, and painters and pointers. When it comes to words and how we express them, they are powerful. Proverbs goes on to describe it this way. Would you read with me, please? When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. This 
is something that you learn early in marriage, that just because you're right, you don't have to indicate that at that particular moment. Sometimes it is wise to hold your tongue for a better opportunity or for a better way to describe it. When our words are many, our sins are close by at hand. There are times to speak, and there are times not to speak. There are times when our actions have to take place instead of take the place of our words. So whether you're a painter or a pointer or a thinker or a person speaking as you talk, this is something that we know for certain, that words are creative. Words are creative. Because we're made in the image of God, and when God speaks, something happens. When we speak, something happens as well. Because we're made in the image of God, our words have power. They make a difference. They bring about change for better or for worse. The words that we use have the power to hurt, to wound, and they also have the ability to heal. I imagine even right now you're thinking of words that have come out of your mouth that you said in anguish, anger, out of grief, out of fear, out of protection, out of vengeance. But you can also think of times where a well-placed word made a difference. I see you. I forgive you. I feel you. I'm trying to understand. I believe in you. Words have power and meaning. I don't know if we'll ever not connect the words I can't breathe. It's powerful. Black lives matter. I can be honest with you that I've never quite understood why folks would get upset when you say, well, all lives matter, because all lives do matter. And then it was explained to me by a friend last week who said it like this. If you have a friend of yours whose family lost a child and then you went to the funeral of that child and people were getting up and eulogizing, talking about the child, and talked about how much this child mattered. And then you get up and you go, well, all kids matter. Okay. I'm beginning to understand now. In two weeks' time, we're going to provide an opportunity live stream to actually continue that conversation. And we're going to have a tiny, small, round table discussion online during the sermon time uh, with a good friend of mine uh, who is a worship pastor at an African-American church in Aurora um, and also some other folks along the way. I hope that you tune in and I hope that you show up for that. Words have power. During the time of the Holocaust, there was the Christenleben, which was technically the breaking of glass when vandals were allowed, to, when people were allowed to go and vandalize Jewish homes 
There were words that were designated for the special people, which was meaning they were set apart to be slaughtered. We in our fallen humanity can be remarkably evil. And that's why we need the grace and the goodness of God. Words have power to hurt or to heal. I go back to my high school days when a friend of mine uh, gave me this challenge. The challenge was very simple. Michael, do you think that you could make someone cry in a single sentence? I had a nickname in high school. They called me The Blade because I had a very sarcastic humor that I used to get attention in inappropriate ways. I'm so glad that sarcasm has completely left my, uh, my existence. And I said to my friend, pick someone. And he picked out a girl across the hallway, and I walked over, and I do not know what I said. But I know two things. I made her cry, and I feel guilty about it to this day. I used the power that God had given me to wound someone for folly rather than to care for someone and encourage them. Proverbs goes on to say, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. The words we use have the power to harm, but they also have the power to heal. One of my favorite proverbs describes it like this here. Gracious speech is like clover honey, good taste to the soul, quick energy for the body. To be able to look at someone and to remind them your life matters. To be able to look someone in the eye and let them know my life is richer and better because of you. To to be able to say to someone, yes, you stumbled, but I'm here to help you walk again. No, not just walk. I'm ready to help you run. To be able to speak into someone's life who believes that they have gone way beyond the grace of God and to say to them, I've got good news for you. God not only forgives your sins, he actually does not even keep a record of your wrongs. You may remember them so that you don't repeat them, but God throws them into the sea of forgetfulness and he remembers them no more. Because you're made in the image of God and because the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you, when you speak into someone's life, there is power because God's power is with you. How much power? Well, we know that when God speaks, the stars and the galaxy were made. We know that when God spoke and everything came into being, that when you speak in God's name, someone's universe is changed. Uni, uni, one, verso, verse, one word, one aptly timed healing word into someone else's life can make a difference for eternity. My friend Brian, as a teenager, shared with me a word, the word Jesus. I had a concept of, if I got my stuff together, then God would possibly, if he's in a good mood that day, show some favor towards me. And he shared with me this, Michael, When you were at your worst, 
God made the decision to give you his best. God spoke and the universe was created. God spoke again. Emmanuel, God with us. And the universe was changed as God took upon our flesh and blood. God spoke hope into the world, not just with words, but with action. And where we have failed to keep the commandments, God says, I'll do what you can't do. I'll live the perfect life. I'll die the perfect death. And I will be raised up for you as a reminder that you have hope that goes on for eternity. And that same one who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary is the very same one who would suffer and die on our behalf, who would cry out on the cross, it is finished. What's the it? The it is the total payment for our sin. The it is the ability to use words of power for healing for the world rather than for hatred. Because God spoke to you his grace. You have the power to speak grace and to create a new universe into the lives of people around you. As followers of the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, we need to understand that our words and our actions need to walk together. So people who are forgiven are known as being people who are forgiving. People who are sinful now become known as people who are patient as God addresses sin in other people's lives because now we are graceful due to our God. Sometimes it is best to remain silent and just let our actions speak. Actions prove who someone is. Words just prove what they want to be. Sometimes we have to just remain quiet. Even in the midst of times when we really, really want to speak. Whoever keeps his, whoever keeps his mouth and his tongue keeps himself out of trouble. Can I get an amen on that one? <laughs> There's a lot of conversations going on around issues of race, which is really a sanctity of life issue. And we need to learn to listen. And we need to learn to keep our mouths shut perhaps for a while and let our actions testify there will be a time to speak. But first we have to sit at the table and to listen to, to conversations that are going on around us. This past Friday night, I had the opportunity to, to sit at the feet, well, to sit at the screen, a Zoom meeting, of about 80 people who had gathered together from state legislature to um, uh, city uh, politicians and so forth, just to have the dialogue around re race relationships. In fact, at our St. John's campus, uh, once a month we have what's called a symposium on race, which is a great conversation of which to be a part. And the speaker that day was addressing folks, white folks, and saying, when you don't know what to do, this is profound, you may want to write it down, take a note. When you don't know what to do, bring a casserole. When someone dies, you show up at the house 
with a casserole. They may have 50 other casseroles, that's okay. But you just show up with sadness in your eyes and you bring a dish to share. In the matter of the tragedy and the evil of racism, for some of us, we need to show up with a casserole. We don't have to say, but we do have to love. And then to say, would you teach me what I need to say? Would you invite me into understanding what you're thinking and you're feeling? And would you encourage me not to make this a temporary thing, but a permanent change in my perspective? If we wanted to summarize the power of words and so forth, we use this at St. John's uh, School. Think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? And as my wife likes to remind me, was that really necessary? <laughs> and then the last one is, what's that word? Kind. To think before we speak and before we act. 37 times in the New Testament. 37 different times there is the admonition and the call to encourage one another. You can knock over a building in a day, but it takes significant time to build one. We're not to be known for people who destroy, but as rather as people who give life. Let us pray.